I am Kevin Griffin, and uh, we are calling this Dharma and Recovery, not to be confused with Recovery Dharma, <laughs> although very similar. And uh, this is uh, week two of uh, four week. I, I guess we can call the series, but that doesn't mean that there's going to be any relationship between one week and the next because it's a different week. Who knows what's going to happen, you know. But I, I, I sort of have been thinking about, I mean, I started last week um, talking about the Four Noble Truths in relation to addiction. And uh, it seems like a good framework to work with. So um, I think we'll keep going with that. Uh, you know, the second truth is the truth of the cause of suffering, which is really the heart of addiction. It's the cause of suffering, Buddha says, is craving. And, and actually, they have the text, so we'll, we'll read from it uh, later. But um, we could get started with a period of meditation, and that will be for 30 minutes, unless I can't tell time, as happened last week. But uh, it should be for 30 minutes. So here I have 7.06, so that would be 7.36, not 7.26. Okay. Good. Nobody ever complains when you ring the bell early. I will say that. It's kind of like getting out of school early. Yeah. So uh, my general approach to... Uh, leading meditations is to is to talk for a while and to, and to give a kind of guidance and then just kind of stop. So sometime at, at some point, probably around 10 or 15 minutes, it'll go quiet. At least I will go quiet. And so just for you to have a sense of what is likely to happen. You can begin by closing your eyes or just lowering your gaze if you're not comfortable having your eyes closed in a group. Now we're just trying to withdraw from the visual world, which is so consuming, such a powerful sense, allows us to bring greater attention to our inner life. And then just checking in with how you're holding your body, the posture, alignment. Noticing any areas of tension that can be softened and just generally having a sense of letting go through the body of relaxing even as you hold the body upright Feeling the breath moving in the body. And you can start to bring the breath into the foreground of awareness. Feeling the sensations either at the nostrils where the air touches coming in and out, or feeling the breath in the belly, the diaphragm, that movement rising and falling.
can be helpful to make a soft mental note with the breath. Just noting in the mind, in, out, or rising, falling. It's words that help you to remember that you are practicing mindful breathing. And we start to attune to subtle sensations in the breath. common and natural for the mind to wander. So that even when we set an intention to be aware of the breath, that we'll often be drawn away from that to the momentum of thought. Our practice just involves coming back when we notice that. That here in this moment of noticing the wandering mind, it's a very revealing moment. How do we react to that? What's going on in the mind and body at that moment? When we first learn to practice, we can have the sense that we're doing it wrong when the mind wanders, that we're coming up short. So then we might start judging ourselves or grading ourselves, turning our meditation into a kind of competition with some imagined goal. This only furthers the agitation of the mind. And so we try to learn to simply let go of the thought and come back. See that there's thinking. Don't add anything to that. Thinking is natural. It's not a failing. The mind will settle of its own accord if we give it the time and space to do that. We don't have to suppress thoughts or push them away. Just keep letting go. Trust in the process.
the moment of waking up from thinking also reveals the after effects of thought if we attune to our feeling tone or mood, emotional state, you start to see the connection between thoughts and feelings. And again, instead of analyzing or trying to control this, we just try to be present for this experience. What does that feel like? The greatest motivation for letting go of thoughts is realizing that thoughts don't feel good. At least some of them, many of them. This also begins to attune us to the subtle nonverbal realm of feeling, a realm of experience that's often unnoticed, unconscious, but that drives a great deal of our behavior and our thinking. Learning to breathe with to just allow whatever feelings are arising helps us to become less impulsive. More careful. more conscious. So while there are pleasant states that it can arise from meditation you may develop some calm and serenity. It's this attunement and that wisdom that comes with that that brings the greatest value. start to understand our own minds, our own habits, our own thoughts and feelings. They're brought into the light, clarity of mindfulness, out of the shadows. Giving us the opportunity to choose what we think about, what we act on, how we respond to the feelings that arise.
Oops. The key to this is not figuring out anything, but just applying attention, careful, engaged, inquisitive attention to our experience. Using the breath as our anchor, as our support. as our connection to the present moment, to our body and our mind.
All right. Well, nice to see everyone. Some people even came back last week. <laughs> Welcome to the folks on Zoom, my friends. Hello. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, um, I'm very grateful that um, when I first encountered Buddhism, it was delivered to this very, you know, westernized and, um, you know, just really relatable well, lens that uh, particularly Joseph Goldstein, Jack Cornfield, Sharon Salzberg, those are my early teachers. And um, they, they were very skilled at taking uh, these sometimes uh, obscure texts and, and making them accessible. So that, so that I came to understand that um, the Four Noble Truths that are about suffering and the end of suffering, that the second Noble Truth was the cause of suffering is clinging or craving. And that makes perfect sense. And when you, when you watch your mind or watch your mind and body in meditation, you can see that playing out. So it's not an abstract principle. It's not a philosophy. It's, it's a felt experience. And and deeply uh, effective because when we see that, it motivates us to want to let go. And that's the kind of the, the Dharma right there. But I do like to go back to um, these early texts and, and probe a little bit into what we have been given to understand the, the Buddha actually said or taught, you know, obviously these are ancient texts that were originally orally transmitted and, and then have been around for a couple thousand years, 2,600 years, something like that. And, and so we can't, it's not like we're getting a transcription of, of what the Buddha said, but, but because there are so many texts that are so consistent in the message they give, we can, we can trust that it was, this is probably pretty close. So last week, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I talked a lot about the first truth, the truth of suffering and, and the ways that the Buddha talks about that. So this is what he says about the second truth. He talks, uh, he's speaking to the monks that are, and they're, they're called bhikkhus in this language, the Pali language. Now, this bhikkhus is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. So we should usually say the cause of suffering, so the origin of suffering. It is this craving which leads to renewed existence accompanied by delight and lust, seeking delight here and there. That is craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, craving for extermination. So we can see that it's a little bit more than just saying craving. So he starts by saying, it is this craving which leads to renewed existence, which sounds like he's talking about reincarnation. And that, that may be a part of the message here, but the way we've come to understand it, the way I understand it is we're really talking about the arising of self or selfing or ego, identification with our experience so that it's no longer just something happening. It's something happening to me. And all the problems that come with that. And then the other thing that I want to point to is that 
where he says that, that he identifies three forms of craving, craving for sensual pleasure, which is pretty obvious. And certainly in addiction circles or squares or triangles, uh, sensual pleasure is a lot of what it's about. I mean, it, it takes other forms, but that's a good starting point. You, know, you have a drink, feels good, you want another drink. Then he says, craving for existence, going back to this term again. So again, we seem to be talking about ego or something like that, being, being somebody. You know, there's lots of ways we can talk about this. And craving for extermination. That's one that I find particularly intriguing because it's, it's almost counterintuitive. Well, like, uh, are you saying that we're, we're, we want to, we're craving for suicide or craving to die? And, and that, that may be implied in here, but I, but again, I think it, it's referring to something a little more sub, subtle than that. And this is something we can also relate to as addicts. That is the wish to turn off the world, to turn off our experiences, to shut it all down. Well, and this can just take the form of, I'm just going to lie down and go to sleep. I mean, I remember in high school when I started to really get depressed, I would just come home from school and just lie down on the couch and go to sleep. And it was just like escape, right? But of course, this can take much more, uh, you know, dangerous forms. Certainly, heroin comes to mind. <laughs> uh, so, you know, a form of extermination. Not uh, drinking to, you know, blackout. But it also, you know, uh, uh, just tuning out. You know, um, I've been. I picked up this book this week. I read it a few years ago, The Graving Mind. If you're familiar with this, it's a really interesting book. If you if you're if you find the uh, if you're interested in sort of the science behind addiction and and everything that it, it could have behind mindfulness as well. Um, and. Uh, you know, he's uh, talking about um, all kinds of cravings from drugs and alcohol to ego and gets into cigarettes and sex and love. Very interesting uh, to see all the connections, right? To start to see that it's all running on the same system. You know, the uh, um, how the you know we we learn how like the brain of somebody who's uh, gambling is similar to somebody who's on crack, right? You hear these stories like, oh, okay. So starting to you know really look at the elements of craving and. And to see the whole system there, because you know, at that that sense of extermination. To just go back to that, you know, the, the even our smartphones are a way. That's so funny. I whenever I say that word, I'm like, are they? Like, the phones that are smart, like, oh, I don't think so. It's, not a, it's just not the right word. We should give them a, we should take them down a couple notches. <laughs> Our fairly intelligent <laughs> phones are moderately intelligent. <laughs> but, you know, how often do we use them to escape from feeling something? You know, and uh, the, first of all, they are the uh, absolute, you know, killer of boredom. 
right? I mean, that's to me, that's like almost 90% of their function, the way they're used. It's just boring. People are walking down the street. And instead of just walking, it's boring to walk down the street, I guess. You know, if you're not, if you're not paying attention, if you're not taking in the world, if you're not engaging the world. Or, you know, I wrote over here on BART. It's like, you know, half the people on BART are just on their phone. Yeah. I was reading a book, so much higher form <laughs> of escapism. <laughs> but uh, we, we, you know, we start to, to see how, uh, you know, there's these avoidance mechanisms, right? This extermination. And, and, you know, that very term, you know, it's kind of sad you know, that, that here we have this life that's pretty unique, uh, considered precious by every society in the world. You know. And yet, in the way we don't want to really be involved in it. <laughs> We want to have our. We want to have sort of like an alternative life, <laughs> something that's not quite really our life, but sort of like a life. You know? So it's exterminating life as it is, this present moment. It's killing it off. So I guess you know what comes to mind as I talk about all that is kind of the layers of of unfolding recovery. And uh, this is a topic that comes up a lot when I talk about this, that, you know, initially for people who are addicts, we're addressing, you know, sometimes a life-threatening behavior, uh, but something that really has a devastating effect on our lives uh, if it's drug and alcohol use. Um, and and when we stop something like that, instead of discovering that, oh, like, now I'm just, like, totally together and connected and happy and loving life, instead we start to discover uh, another level, other levels of addiction. I know for me, relationships were like the first thing that I spent really the first maybe seven years of my recovery focused on once I just stopped drinking. I, did, I wasn't really thinking about drinking and drugs anymore, but then it was like seeing like, oh, there's this. And then food is a very common one and, and work, you know. And, and, you know, we deal with these things that are, you know, ha have kind of a uh, clear form that they're, they're things, right? But as we keep working on this stuff and the peeling these layers away, we come to see that it's actually all, as I say, connected to something underneath all that, right? That there's something more primal almost, essential. Uh, that's going on. And I think that what we call recovery, actual recovery rather than sobriety or being clean, really demands that we get, uh, you know, come to into a, a real uh, intimate relationship with these underlying, with this underlying craving. Um, and, to, and to be able to, to be with it and to not run from it, not exterminate it. No, it's like, you know, the, the bug killer, right? Get the exterminator to come over. So take some DEET. And spray or anyway, sorry, it's getting a weird <laughs> image. Uh, you know, my sense of that, of what's going on there, uh, one version of it is that 
there's this underlying longing, we could say for love or for connection, to not be separate from others, to, to feel whole, to feel complete. But to get there, we have to first really feel the suffering there. And so it's you know, maybe you know, talking about the, the noble the four noble truths, the first truth, the truth of suffering, that the Buddha says we need to understand it, which I talked about last week. To understand our suffering does not mean that we sort of want to go, mm, you know, yeah, I'm suffering. <laughs> you know, it means that we're allowing it in. We're not exterminating our suffering. We're not trying to avoid it. And and suffering maybe is too strong a word. Uh, sometimes it sounds like we're being tortured or something. You know? So... This word dukkha in Buddhism, you know, has various different uh, translations. But one of the meanings that I like is unsatisfactoriness. The sense that it's never enough. You know? um, and, and so to feel that, to feel that sense of longing for something that can never quite be satisfied. And to, and to be okay with that, you know, because again, I, I, recovery isn't about getting to some idealized state, just like enlightenment, I don't think is about getting to some idealized state where you, because a state is a, is a solid thing. It's, it's, a, it's static. And by definition, then it, that's not what we experience because everything is impermanent. So we're not, you know, supposed to get to this place of uh, free from all desires, you know, I'll just, I mean, sure that we see texts that say, okay, maybe there's a state at this point one can get to, but, but those people also die and get, get old and sick and die, even if they get to that place. So. It's not a, it doesn't uh, give you a pass from life. But, the, you know, our, much of our addiction is, is this attempt to exterminate our experience. And when we make you know, to make this choice to, to go in a different direction to try to be with our experience. The first thing we're faced with is fear. The fear of actually feeling. Before we can even get to the feelings, the underlying feelings, we're faced with the resistance to feeling them. Uh, I mean, a lot of times people will say, oh, like, I can't meditate because I can't sit still or I can't stop thinking. And really what I hear is, I can't be with myself. Uh, you know, it's it's um, too uncomfortable. And that's what this meditation practice really is designed to kind of hold our hand, to walk through. Uh, the practice uh, that I've been particularly working with over the last few years is the from the Anapanasati Sutta. And it's just that just means the discourse on mindful breathing. But it's funny, you know, that that discourse, well, that's its title, but it's not mindful breathing is the thread throughout it, but there are 16 different steps in it. 
and 14 of them include something with the breath. So um, Buddha Dasabhikkhu, who was one of the great Thai forest masters of the 20th century, when he talked about this sutta, he called it mindfulness with breathing, mm -hmm. which I think is a more accurate translation of what the Buddha is describing. It, it's structured so that one starts with mindfulness of the breath and the body, and, and you work with that area long enough that the body starts to get calm. And once the body gets calm, it's very natural that you start to attune to the more subtle experience within the body, the feeling world, the feeling realm. And, and But because the body is calm, you're able to enter into that with less resistance. The, the, the calming of the body calms the fear aspect of it. Uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi talks about it as that concentration cools the mind. You know, but there's this cooling and that allows, we're not like pushed into, okay, start feeling. It's like, no, we work with the body, with the breath until really we feel safe enough to go, oh, let me let me let in something, what's underneath that. And I, that second stage, so it's four, there are four stages of the, of the sutta. That second stage is in the feeling realm. And it's interesting that the way the Buddha characterizes it, he's, he doesn't talk about fear at all in this sutta. He talks about joy. He says that when the, my, when the body becomes calm, that naturally this feeling of joy will come over you. That that can happen. <laughs> I, I think I think he had a particular purpose in this in this sutta that he was trying to bring out the positive side of it. But there are other places where he talked about the fear that comes up in meditation. Um, But we, when we move into that realm, then that we go through the similar process as we do with the body, which is that we become very attuned to the feeling realm with the breath. So now we're feeling the body and the feeling realm, the, as he says, joy and rapture. And, and then that all starts to calm down. And then what's revealed, because it's like a stages of revelation in a sense, is the mind itself, the place where this is all happening. And this is where we really can transform the experience from one that's personal and, and therefore has a more potential risk in it for us. So the fear, when, when there's no self to get involved, then there's really no fear that's going to, because fear is always related to self and it's about protecting self, right? Because I mean, that's our, you know, our survival, uh, the evolution is uh, it created fear in order to protect us from danger. But when, when we have the insight into the non-personal reality of our experience, then the idea of fear is kind of taken off the table because there isn't really anything to fear. It's just seeing that, oh, there is awareness that is and, and within awareness, there is the body, there are the feelings, there are the thoughts. All this is happening in awareness. But awareness itself isn't really participating other than as a container for our experience. And we see that, that so what we call self is just this stuff that goes on in awareness. But if awareness is what's seeing it all, then 
there's where's the self in that? I don't know. I might, might be falling off the couch, but <laughs> but uh, that's <laughs> so I've completely lost the thread. Whatever I was talking about. I mean, I I know what I was talking about. I'm just trying to I have to connect it back to craving. <laughs> So craving, <laughs> let me go back to what the Buddha said, because I think this, this might even help us to bring this back and bring it all back home. It is this craving which leads to renewed existence. Craving for existence, craving for extermination. So craving is the partner of, is always connected to self. That if desire or aversion, which is another way of describing aversion, of de describing craving, another words for it. If either desire or aversion is appearing, then there is selfing happening in that moment, right? When you let go of that, when there isn't any wanting going on, then there's no selfing going on. So the Buddha says the third noble truth. Now, this is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. It is the remainderless fading away and cessation of that same craving. The giving up and relinquishing of it, freedom from it, non-reliance on it. So the end of suffering is letting go of craving. And that craving, it, it, that means that it's also letting go of self. So this process that I described, this meditative process, is the way that we get to that place where we're in this remainderless fading away and cessation of the craving. That, that language, in fact, fading away and cessation turns up in the fourth part of the Anasati Sutta. The Buddha says to contemplate impermanence, fading away, cessation, and letting go. So all of this is tied together and it's not as complicated as perhaps me talking about it for half an hour, make it sound. This practice, this meditative practice is really quite simple. It's just talking about it uh, uh, makes it into something more complicated in a way because we don't really, it's, it's a, essentially a nonverbal experience, a non-conceptual experience. But the only way we can communicate about it is through words and concepts. <laughs> and so there's this little uh, uh, awkwardness trying to, you know, it's, it's better to like sit with like the silent guru, like Ramana Maharshi, who didn't speak for like 30 years, and people would just climb the mountain where he lived in it. Southern India, and, and he would just be sitting there, and they would just sit with him, and and then a little after a little while, they'd be like, "Okay, I got it." And then, and then we'd go. Yeah, I don't have that power. I, I haven't developed it yet. I'm working on it. You know, one day. <laughs> but it all starts with this simple idea of being with what's happening. And that uh, it, it's a, such a simple idea, but everybody in this room knows how difficult it is to execute, right? It's like, uh, and, and I think that one of the problems with meditation and with how we think about it is that we get so wrapped up in the struggle to try to do that first thing which is to try to be present that, and that the problem with that seems to be thinking. So we get into this 
kind of battle with our thoughts. And when the thoughts stop, we think we're winning. And so we just hang out there in that lovely space. But that's not what we're trying to get out of this. Because we're actually, we want to be looking and understanding this process, this process by which suffering is created. So that's why I like to add to my meditation instruction, when you notice that your mind has wandered, before you come back to the breath, notice how you feel. Because in that moment, what you're feeling is dukkha. You're feeling the suffering. And it's sometimes quite subtle, sometimes not so subtle. But you, you, it doesn't feel good, so you don't want to hang out with it. Like, you know, you're, you're meditating, meaning you're spacing out. And then you're like, oh, man, I'm like spacing out. If you if you don't just come back to your breath, if you do, what what does spacing out feel like? It feels like self, it turns out. If you want to know what self feels like, it feels like spacing out. It to me, it's kind of like this. <clears throat> Something's got a hold of me. There's kind of a eh. and so then I I often take a kind of deeper breath. And there's kind of a release that happens. So it's physical. That's why this is all interconnected, right? Our body and our mind. It's not like separate things. They're all working together. But you, you notice that and you see, oh, well, that's unpleasant. And you can say, okay, let me take a breath and come back. Okay, that's better. So what did you, what just happened here? You saw suffering which was the unpleasant experience. And if you, if you consider for a moment, reflect on how that happened, you realize that the suffering happened because you were thinking. And if you look at 90 something percent of your thoughts, there is some form of craving in that thought. You're thinking about the future, the past, there's something some feeling of like, oh, it's, uh, uh, I'm going to think my way into things being better than the way they are. You know? And so that's, oh, that's the cause of suffering. So now I've just seen the first two noble truths. I've seen the suffering and the cause of suffering. But when I come back and I let go for a moment and feel a little bit of relief from that, I'm experiencing the remainderless fading away and cessation of that suffering. I'm abandoning it. I'm letting go. You know, now I've seen the first three noble truths, right? And I'm starting to see for myself how I create suffering moment by moment by moment by moment in my life. Not just when I'm meditating. It's most of the time I'm not noticing it. When I'm meditating, I notice it. Which is another reason why it can be hard for people to meditate. Right. I like, I'd rather not, you know, let me just go for a, get out of here. Let me turn on something, distract me. Right. Uh, and that's the challenge of meditation. The first thing we have to do is it's just like sobriety. It's like, I got to get through that wall. You know, I got to face the crap that's in the way of just being, Oh, it's not that bad. You know, it, it, you know, the story of our resistance, the story of our longing is like, it's so big. It's, it's I, you know, it's that uh, what's this, Judson Brewer talking to a smoker who's trying to quit smoking. So it's like, it feels like if I don't have a cigarette, my head's going to explode. Right. I mean, I felt like if I didn't have a drink, I, I didn't, and I never verbalized it or thought about it because it was just like, I had to have a drink. It wasn't, it wasn't a question, you know, and, but you discover like, it's not a big monster, you know, my feelings that I'm resisting, uh, any of this stuff, they're not that bad, you know, <laughs> and you, you know, if you get through it five minutes through it and you're like, oh, wait, oh, oh, that's kind of nice, you know, and you find, oh, yeah, there. 
So we're we're trying to train ourselves to let go. I mean, to me, this is like what this practice is really about. I've probably said that about 90 different things. This is what this practice is really about. But yeah, it's definitely one of the things that it's really about, which is training myself to let go. Because I am trained to attach. That's, again, the human condition. It's our condition. That's how we are you know, brought up. It's what the society tells us. It's what our genetics tell us. Cling, 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 get, get, get. You know, control, control, control. So I have to really train myself to let go. And how do I train myself to let go? I see the pain of clinging. Just like, why did I stop drinking? Finally, I saw the pain of my drinking. You know, Finally, I saw that that didn't work. And so, if, you know, I think one of the things the Buddha was trying to do was to force us all to be aware. I mean, that's what he what it says here. He, he was trying to get us all to be aware of our suffering. He wasn't trying to make us suffer. He was like, you're already suffering. You just don't know it, you know, not on the level that we're talking about, not on the level that's going to transform you. If you see it clearly, you're going to be like, why am I doing this? You know. I mean, we've all, I know, been through the experience of like rage or real anger, right? And then you you feel it. And, and you're just like, oh, it just feels so bad, right? And, you know, at a certain point, if you pay attention to it enough, you start to see like, it's nearly not worth it. You know, as children, you know, I mean, I had a terrible temper when I was a child and I, and I still can go off. Just ask my wife. But, you know, at a certain point, you kind of realize, oh, that's, that's not worth it. And that, that to me is like one of the most obvious examples of seeing how, uh, you know, dukkha is created and how just letting go is the, is the way to, to freedom. No matter that. So I should say, I feel like, you know, I talk a little bit more than about the fourth noble truth, although maybe just very briefly, because I want to open it up. That the fourth noble truth is the way to the end of suffering, right? So it's like it, it, everything that I've been talking about, about the mechanics of it, is really coming out of the fourth noble truth, which is the Eightfold Path. And it's, and it's about, you know, mindfulness, and effort. It's about sila, following precepts. It's about um, intention and view, how we view the world. But it's this uh, uh, incredible system that that cultivates uh, all these qualities that we're trying to develop to essentially learn to let go more, you know, consistently, more efficiently. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just open it up for like questions or comments or reflections if anybody has any. Yeah, Jimmy. I really like when you were, when you read the, the, the Buddha's description of um, relinquishing our craving and clinging in order to experience the cessation of suffering and how he said, you know, the giving up and the surrendering and the non-reliance on our craving and clinging. That non-reliance really struck me because that's what I find I do and have done throughout my life is rely on various objects of clinging and craving and rely on the craving itself to, I think, in the moment, relieve some suffering or distract myself from my suffering or, and it's, it's, it's a mugs game. I mean, it's foolish. It doesn't work. 
right. reliance on some craving or object of craving or just the 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 process of craving it it doesn't work and letting and real and understanding that that's what i've been doing mm -hmm. is relying on that is has been revelatory yeah. you know I, I relied on drugs and alcohol i relied on my craving of drugs and alcohol too mm -hmm. and it, it it turned out that it was really really destructive when i realized that and i gave them up it was it was this vast um feeling of suffering ending in that realm in my life and i also like what you said about how we have this big huge image of our suffering and it i mean sometimes it can become poetic in its immensity and when we finally start to see that when I finally start to see that and I realize that it's it's not as big or as bad no. as I thought it was going to be it's it's it some it makes me chuckle I had an experience with Noam not long ago he asked me how am I doing and I said you know I'm not doing well you know I really miss being in a partnership and 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 I'm just having a hard time getting used to not being a part. And I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I'm, I'm used to be, to not being in a partnership. I've been a, a non-partner for a long time. I'm used to it. And he goes, yeah, you just don't like it. Mm -hmm. And we both laughed and it was just like, yeah, I just don't yeah. like it. It's not a big disaster. Yeah. It's not some big, huge thing. It's just, I, I don't like it. And that took so much weight out of it. It was like pop the balloon. And it was just like, no, it's not that bad. It's not that big a deal. Unpleasant. It's just, it's just so unpleasant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. That's great. If I say something, do I have to do that? Or do I it's, just talk loud? It's for the people on Zoom. Oh, wow. Well, it's well. not for us. Well, so, thank you. That's very kind of you. I mean, I don't have to get up. So suffering. As an addict, I can remember that um, uh, that time, there's times when I would awaken and say, not today. And then in the course of that day, sometimes hours or minutes later, find myself going to do that very thing. I mean, that's suffering in, in a way that um, sucks the life out of me. And then when I, when I got into recovery and I looked at that and I realized I'm free, then I learned about suffering, about the Four Noble Truths. And all of a sudden, I started to see it all over. It was an epiphany of sorts, but it was also kind of mind-boggling. I guess what I, in a form of a question, I get confused about craving and aversion. Yeah. Now, on a very primitive level, I, as an addict, so I, oblivion. <laughs> now that was for negative feelings that I didn't want, but it was also the choice. I have a success, so I go and get obliterated. Yeah. Um, I like, really it, it, so I know that I was avoiding my life and creating more suffering as I went. I just, I don't know if you could say anything about that. One thing I would just add this and I would end with this. Um, Something you said this week was really, really important for me. Um, I, I don't remember how you said it, but that that being in that place of neutrality while I'm meditating to actually see thoughts as objects and as subjects mm -hmm. that was really that was meaningful. I know. That's good. Anyway.
Um, I, oh, so the you. person behind you, actually, she had her hand up. Oh. So you don't have to take it back. But uh, I'll, I'll just say something about the, the question about aversion and craving inversion. The, the simplest way for me to bring those together is to say wanting things to be different from the way they are because that encompasses both. Either I want to feel more pleasure or I want to feel less discomfort. But it's, and that's, that makes clear that they're, they function in the same way and that they, they are the same exact problem. That they are both forms of desire. The desire either to get rid of something for extermination or the, the desire for to acquire something. But it's all about wanting things to be different from the way they are. Yeah. Hi, thank you. That was all very interesting. Um, I certainly understand the extermination part. Mm -hmm. um, you were saying that we, we, the, I like the idea of satisfactoriness. You know, we're all looking for satisfactoriness. And you said we can't expect to get it because things are always changing. Right. Yeah. So, well, that leaves us. Satisfaction implies, again, something static like, I've arrived, like I'm full. I, like we had dinner tonight, I'm full. I never have to eat again. <laughs> oh, no, that's right. So, so, so uh, it's unsatisfactory because it can't, you can't hold on to it. But you're not saying we can't have joy. Oh, no, not at all. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's... Uh, you know, without joy, what's the point? You know. Yeah, I often wonder. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing I've been also been reading this book quite a bit, a new book from the Bayagiri Monastery, More Than Mindfulness, which you can download for free. Mm -hmm. I have it also on my Kindle, from, uh, downloading their ebook. And there's a great uh, piece in here. This is by a bunch of the Ajans, and it's by Ajahn Sona, and and he says something really interesting that I have never heard it quite put this way. He said, we are trying to let go of unwholesome states, you know, in the formal language of Buddhism. We're trying to let go of the, the negative unwholesome things. We are not trying to let go of the wholesome states. When the wholesome states arise, when feelings of joy arise or peace, serenity, we are not going, oh, that's impermanent, just let it go. In fact, when the Buddha describes the four great efforts, <laughs> there's the effort to avoid unwholesome states that haven't arisen, to abandon unwholesome states that have arisen, and then to cultivate wholesome states that have not arisen. <laughs> and to maintain wholesome states that have arisen. So we're supposed to maintain, if joy and happiness arises, it's not that we're supposed to cling to them, but we are meant to try to keep them going, you know, maintain them. How, how did that, and so how did that happen? You know, how can I uh, keep that alive in a, in a healthy way? Now, if we cling to them, then we are, you know, then we're not really practicing right intention. Right intention always says letting, we're letting go. So it's, you know, it's a, I think a significant distinction to make. And that, and in fact, in the, I was talking about the Anapanasati, the mindfulness of breathing sutta, that in the second stage in that, it says breathing in, uh, bringing awareness to joy, breathing out, bringing awareness to joy, breathing in, bringing awareness to happiness, breathing out, bringing aware awareness to happiness. So these are qualities that the Buddha absolutely uh, encourages. In fact, he says, you know, even if you look at the, the seven facts of enlightenment, sorry for all the lists, but, you know, joy comes before tranquility and concentration. So it's actually 
uh, this isn't one hundred percent true because I've I've gotten quite concentrated when I was depressed, but it it's not the you know recommended approach that you know it's easier for the mind to get peaceful when one feels joyful mm -hmm. when one feels happy yeah the other thing i wanted to ask about is uh, oh it's really interesting you're talking about looking at the suffering when you're breathing and your mind wanders but i don't think i see that as suffering that moment because there are a lot of carefully arranged layers of defense there. So I'm going off to thinking to myself, I've got to remember to put the potatoes on when I get home. Mm -hmm. So I'm disappointed in myself. I realize that I've now wandered off from meditating. I've, I've lost that round. But it's still really important that I remember to put the potatoes on. So I can't just see that suffering, which I think it probably is. So, uh, the, the, the dukkha there, the suffering there, is the feeling around that. It's not the thought itself. The thought isn't the problem. The, the problem is that feeling like, oh, oh my God, like, oh, I got to remember this, you know, and, and what's that feel like? So that's the thing that I suggest you attune to. Yeah, that's true. It's a heavy weight. Yeah. Forever. Well, everything is impermanent. So <laughs> there's that one advantage. So we are officially out of time, but there was a hand up in the back that I I don't want to abandon. Oh, sure. Yeah. I think the bigger one is Hello. Um, I am just curious. Right, I'm like, I'll try to make it quick. I don't know quite how to articulate this, but like, I guess I've been thinking a lot lately about, you mentioned desire in the like talk that you just gave. And in, the, I'm like two weeks sober right now off uh, a relapse. So my brain is not super coherent, but I, I guess I'm just like, I'm grappling with how like in looking at dukkha and like recognizing how cravings and desire and all of that can like be entwined with that, but also being like 27 and like wanting to like explore life in ways that I've like in many ways in my addiction been so closed off to. And like, I guess just grappling with how can desire be something that is like leading me toward a better life, a more connected life and like trying to help the world be a little better and my interactions be better and things like that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, well, I, I, again, there's a like, kind of a language uh, key element here. The Buddha makes the distinction between two forms of desire, one that's called tanha, which is the, what he's talking about in the sutta, the craving for sensual pleasure and for ego. And, and that word actually translates as uh, thirst, interestingly, yeah. uh, by coincidence. But then there's another form of desire called chanda, which is right intention. It's the wish for just what you're describing, for, for wholesome life, for, to, to be of service, to to realize insight, to cultivate loving kindness, cultivate compassion. Yeah, so so that form of desire, just like the, the feelings of happiness, uh, that's the one that you should develop and trust and follow. Yeah. Okay, thanks, wonderful note to end one. So let's just uh, close with the dedication of merit. Just as the 12 steps end by saying that our spiritual awakening should be used in service to others. So to the Buddha says that we practice out of compassion for all beings. May any benefit we've derived from being together and practicing and exploring the Dharma tonight be of benefit to those who suffer. 
May all beings be free from suffering. 